Padre, en esta noche estamos agradecidos, Señor, por una oportunidad más que tú nos has dado de reunirnos en tu nombre. Gracias porque tú sigues siendo la razón y el motivo por el cual nosotros cada miércoles nos reunimos a esta hora, Señor, para aprender de ti. Gracias por la bendición que el hermano Ale ha sido para tu iglesia, Señor. Gracias por la manera en que tú lo unges a él para que pueda compartir su sabiduría con nosotros, Señor, la sabiduría que tú le has dado y el entendimiento de tu palabra. Mira ahora, Padre, de una manera muy especial, quiero presentarte las mentes y los corazones de los jóvenes que han de escuchar lo que el hermano va a enseñarnos y que, Señor, tú trates con ellos y con cada uno de los que vamos a escuchar, pero de una manera especial Amén. con ellos, Señor. Ellos uh, necesitan muchísimo de ti, Señor, y necesitan entender tu palabra para poder vivirla, Padre. En el nombre de tu Hijo Jesús, yo te pido que tú le des una porción fresca al hermano para que la comparta con nosotros y que nos des entendimiento para que nosotros podamos aprender de ti, Señor. En el nombre de tu Hijo Jesús, lo ponemos en tus manos. Padre. Amén, Señor. Amén. Amén. La lección está en Mateo 14. Uh, Mateo 14. Yo había escrito algunas cositas ahí. Estaba sentado. Ahora no sé dónde yo lo puse. Pero vamos a comenzar a leer en el versículo uh, 21. Gracias. Versículo 21. I think, it's I think like English, brother, Got it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm speaking Spanish. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say. Okay, the might... story tonight is in, in Matthew chapter <laughs> Matthew chapter 14, uh, verse 21 to 33. It's, we have to read the, almost everything uh, because uh, it, it is a story. And a story has to be um, read complete. So... Uh, those of you who whose face I can't see, um, if you want to uh, come on so we can see your face, uh, it's fine. If not, I might call you to to read or because you want to be partakers. Most of you want to be partakers. I'm not just uh, listening. We want you to participate and ask questions and things uh, of that nature. Okay, so beginning in verse 21, uh, we could start, but we're going to go ahead and start in verse 22. And it says that, and straightway, <clears throat> remember, uh, before I keep reading, please have a Bible with you. It's important okay, that you have the Bible and you follow uh, what we are reading. And straightway, which means right away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side uh, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when it, the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the south, Um, I'm sorry. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they crowd, cry out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, If it, if it be thou, in other words, if, if, if this is really you, uh, bid me come unto thee on the water. Tell me to, uh, to come to you. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou 
doubt, or why do you doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the son of God. And uh, I am going to be dealing with uh, worshiping Christ. Worshiping Christ is going to be the thought that we are going to be dealing with. Uh, I don't know for how many classes. Uh, the key verse in this lesson is verse 33. And the key word in this verse is the word then. Then. Uh, those are the key words that are important uh, as we begin to study uh, this lesson. In verse 33 says, then, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him. That word is very important, then, and you will understand why later. Um, no before, uh, no after, but then they worship him. Uh, this word, then, teaches us that certain things happen, and then they worship him. So what had happened? Okay, we are going to approach it this way. This is uh, the introduction. The key word of this introduction is the word great. Great. Number one, the great discovery of the disciples. It was a great discovery because then they worship him. This is the first time that they confess that Christ was the son of God and they worship him. Then they worship him. Now, in Matthew 3, 17, and you don't have to go, but I'm giving it to you. I know that some of you are taking notes. Others do not take notes. Because they have a computer in their minds, which is wonderful. Uh, in Matthew 3.17, the father had declared uh, that Jesus was his son. It was uh, a recognition of the deity of Christ. The father had declared it. In Matthew 8.29, the demons had declared, truly you are the son of God. So the father had declared it, the demons had declared it, and not many months later, finally, after seeing certain things, the disciples declared it. It is very interesting that the, before the disciples actually declared that Jesus was actually the son of God and they worshiped him, the devil or had already declared it. It was a great discovery indeed, a great discovery. Uh, the great discover, discovery of the disciples is also the great desire of God. Great discovery, great desire, the great desire of God because God wants to be worshipped. In the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, Thou shalt not worship any image, for I am God, uh, the Lord your God. He was saying in a very specific way, You ought to worship me. And me alone. It was established. Uh, why can he demand this? Because he is the creator. Okay. And uh, God said. Thou shall have not. Thou shall have no other gods. Before me. So in the New Testament. The same uh, declaration appears. 
in Revelation chapter 22. You don't have to go and look it. I'm just going to tell you the scriptures for those of you who are interested. Matthew, 20, I mean, Revelation 22 verse 8 says, And John saw these things and heard them. And when he had heard and seen, he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. We show him these things. Then said he unto me, the angel said, See thou do it not. Don't do it. Don't dare not to do it. For I am a fellow servant. And he says, Worship God. Worship God. So uh, as we keep reading in John 4, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman, we find another great discovery. And it's the fact that God, who doesn't need anything, and is not looking for anything, and has need of anything, he said, Jesus said, the Father is looking for worshipers. He's looking for worshipers. He wants to be worshipped. Christ is God because he never refused worship. This is one of the issues uh, with some people, even in so-called uh, Christian circles, they have an issue with the deity of Christ. Was he a prophet? Was he uh, a great man, a miracle worker, a great teacher? Even the Muslims, uh, believe in the reality of Christ. And I was thinking uh, these few days uh, how the world changed after Jesus. Uh, everything in the society, one way or the other, is touched by Jesus Christ. There's no another. I know there are different ones in the world. Uh, 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 people uh, Worship things that they were not supposed to worship. There are some some figures that were teachers, and they were good teachers. They got, had good intentions, but they got, they were never called gods. Uh, they people that worship them today, they worship in ignorance uh, because they were never at the beginning. Uh, they were seen as divine creatures. But it has developed through the years. So my question is, what is worship? Do we understand what worship is? Can I hear from some of you? What, what is worship to you? Don't be I, mean, afraid. A lot of, it's, I think a lot of forms of worship is worship uh, in prayer, is worship in, in, in singing. His worship and and um, and uh, being a good example and uh, to others is uh, his worship and uh, and and doing great things for others like you know like giving back to communities or, or I don't know going out singing for old people like you know doing community things there's a lot of different ways I think yeah but my question is can... what does worship mean. Okay. It's not what we okay. what we do for worship. Is is okay. what does the word means to you? Worship. When you think of worship, what are you thinking about, Manoloima? It's a close relationship. Okay. Uh, it could be used, but still, the question is not answered. James, can you tell me? Can you help me out here? What is worship to you, son? When you think of worship, what do you think you're doing? Are you hearing me? Huh? Oh. No, I can hear you. I can hear you. Uh, uh, you didn't hear me, did you? No, I heard you. I heard you. Okay. What does worship mean to you? When you think of worship, what comes to your mind? When you hear that word, what comes to your mind? It cannot be a pizza slice or bologna sandwich. What, what comes to your mind? Nathaniel. Nathaniel? They had 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you help us out? Yeah, I, well, when I think of worship, I think of giving appreciation appreciation to God. Um, by appreciation, I feel that it can be anything, whether it's uh, anything. Uh, it's just, yeah, as in like you know, even the grass, the sky, and all His creation, or just giving appreciation just because He's uh, because we're alive for the things that He has done. That's what you mean. Or even just because you know we are alive, or the fact that you know even Jesus had died on the cross to give Him that appreciation. Okay, so the word would be appreciation. Okay, who else? Uh, Joseph, what does worship mean to you, son? I was thinking the way that you acknowledge God in your life. Acknowledging God mm -hmm. in your life. Yeah. Okay. Um, Brother Figueroa, no, you're in Montana. Uh, let me see. Um, where is um, Madison? Are you there, Sister Madison? What, what is worship to you? Um, worship to me is, I guess it's like that feeling in your heart when you're giving glory to God and like. Hey, giving glory to God. Okay, that's mm -hmm. enough. Glory to God. We have glory to God. We have appreciation. What else? See, that's the reason why I ask these questions. Because a lot of times we use words repeatedly. And really we have not stopped to uh, actually look into the word itself. What does it mean to worship? Honoring. Uh, all you have is to do is open a dictionary. Is it honoring God? Honoring God. That's another one. Giving honor to God. Uh, Revering him. Uh, extravagant. Extravagant respect. I was going to say respect. Devotion. Mm. Um... A great fear of reverence to him, giving him credit and honor, recognition, bowing before him, acknowledging him as the only one. You cannot worship God if you are worshiping something else. Okay, let's make that clear. These are some of the things that I, I wrote down in this little paper here when I was uh, over there in my, in, my, in my chair. Number one, we become what we worship eventually. It does not mean that you're gonna become Christ or that you're gonna become God. But whatever you worship, you become like that thing that you are giving your devotion to because you get involved. Uh, we regard whatever that is as the most important in your life. Whatever you worship, it becomes the most important thing in your life. And uh, it doesn't have to be an idol. Uh, some people in the world worship the stars, the moon, the sun, fire, mountains, rivers. The Nile is worship in Egypt. Today I was looking at the documentary in the Nile. Uh, but many things are worship in the world. In some places, they worship coconuts. Uh, another thing about worship is that anything that we dedicate ourselves to is something that we're worshiping. It could be your career. It could be your business. It could be uh, anything that you regard as the most important and you, that you dedicate yourself to is something that you are worshiping. And finally, we end up submitting ourselves to what we worship. So as you worship Christ and you worship him 
as you get a deeper and a greater revelation of him, you will end up, and I'm not talking about this after a few years, or I'm just talking about in a period of time, which can be very short. You mm-hmm. keep, uh, you, you end up submitting yourself to him gladly because of what has been revealed to you in your heart, okay? Uh, we live in the time when people worship um, certain agendas, uh, certain causes. Uh, the world is a worshiping crowd. Everybody is worshiping. Uh, even atheists are worshiping. Why are they worshiping? Their agenda. There's no God, and people who do not believe in God uh, are activists, and that becomes their religion. You know, you can end up worshiping uh, a certain type of even a, a diet. Okay, we we have people that worship their bodies, and I am not the only one who believes that. I have read the books about people that do bodybuilding, it gets to the place that that bodybuilding system becomes their God. And they become admired themselves in the mirrors, admiring, thinking, talking about that. Some people can worship their their own tattoos. And you may think that I am not well in my head. I am very well in my head, thank you. But these things are not coming out of my brain. These things that I keep finding uh, in expressions, in books, in newspapers, and in the media. All right? So this thing that I am not a worshiper, no, that's not true. We all are involved in some kind of worship. You are Mm. not neutral. You want to believe God. But it is not so. You are deceiving yourself into believing that you are not worshiping anything. You could end up worshiping yourself. Fools will do that. By the way, the Bible says that in, in Psalms 41, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Yeah. So uh, this was a and is the great desire of God. It was not only a great um, discovery for the disciples, but it's also the great desire of God to be honored, to be worshipped. Worship. And um, whenever you have children, if you ever have one or two or three, whatever, you will find that you expect something from your children. You expect for them, from them, at least honor. You expect obedience. You expect appreciation. Especially a mother that put his life, her life in the line or on the line by giving birth. So it is expected. And uh, we need to honor that. So definitely the fact that God desires worship and he wants worship. He deserves worship. He's worthy of our worship. It's a normal thing. It's just as normal as when you do something, you expect credit. An appreciation, don't you? Let's let's think that that you invent something or you do something for the good of mankind or for the good of society or for the good of your family. Don't you expect thanks? It doesn't make any difference to you if they acknowledge it or not. If you are a normal person, because you know, there's a possibility that somebody may not be normal. But if you are a normal person, you will expect expect words of appreciation. 
Okay. So is it wrong? Is a abnormal that God will expect appreciation for creating this world? For making it possible that on this planet called Earth, we can breathe anywhere else we have to take oxygen but we have oxygen in this planet the only one that we know of where there's life what people are saying people can say all kind of things but nothing has been proven and who are the witnesses you and me so uh, people who look at God like a tyrant okay Uh, or that he is, is um, uh, yeah, let's, let's think that God would be a tyrant, okay? Well, if he is, he's still God, isn't he? So whether you like him or not, he's still God. And you owe him. And you're going to have to give an account to him. I don't like that God. It doesn't make no difference. The fact that you don't like that God means that there is a God. <laughs> so true. People are so yes. uh, complex <laughs> in their minds. Common sense tells you. The atheist, I don't believe in God. Why are you get so mad about it? Why you should get so upset about it? Why you fight so much against him? If he does not exist, what is your problem? What is their issue? Why don't you quit using his name? All right. So it is the only a great discovery, a great desire to be worship, but it's also the great document of faith for the church. This lesson of scripture gives us a clear and definite vision of the deity of Christ, his authority, his power, his love, and his glory. The disciples worship him because of the specific things that happened that night. Then they worship him. Before, they might have sent him as a prophet as a miracle worker, as somebody that uh, they have actually gotten used to, attached to, but then they worship him. I keep making emphasis on that. They realized that they were before almighty God and they knew the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Jews were very, very, very careful about that. The fact that they worship Christ teaches anyone that the disciples saw the divinity of Jesus Christ. So let us look into this into the lesson because we have not even entered into it. Let us see his divine authority. Did Jesus have authority? That's very important. The authority of Christ. As we look through the scriptures, people acknowledged that Jesus taught, taught with authority. He taught with authority. Mark chapter 1, verse 27. Would you please, one of you, look it up? And read it, and I'll appreciate it. Verse what? Um, Mark one twenty-seven. I have I have the New Kings. Is that okay? Um, yes, yeah, some of the old It's one. fine. It's fine. Walter, be ready because okay. I'm coming to for you, son. Okay, Mark <laughs> one twenty-seven. Then, then they were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, just, just a second. saying, what let's, is let's this? Just, just a second. Read it very slow. Okay. Then they were all amazed. Okay. Who was amazed? 
Oh. Did you just read it? Oh. Oh, right? Is that what it says? Hey. It say no. I said uh, uh, it doesn't really say. It say this says they. Then they were all amazed. That they all were amazed. That's what it says. Yeah. Is that what it says? Then they were all amazed. Okay. So why why are you doubting? When you're reading, it says then all right. Is that what it says? Yeah. So all, all that were there, okay. were um, amazed of what? Come on, son. Um, they are amazed of Jesus. Help him out because he's stuck. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a little stuck actually. I'm like, yeah, you're stuck. Anyone, please. They were amazed because he took out um, the the evil spirit from from the person. Who is that talking? Yes, Becky, that's oh, good, Becky. Yes, yes, yes. But what else it yeah. says? Uh, it's it in there. I'm telling that they were amazed because uh, the Lord had in His word authority. Um, not only by the miracle he made, but uh, the authority that he had when he, he teached to the people. Okay, um, that, yeah, the whole verse needs uh, to be read. The, the, the fear of God. Yeah, when you only read a piece of the verse, you don't get the whole thing. Yeah. It says that he, they were amazed at the things that he did and amazed at what? At the authority that he used to do what? Come on, help me out. Can I read the... I'm 75 years the, old. Help me out. Verse. Ivy, did I... Amazed. Does your and hair so allow you to read? Yes, yes. Your they hair. were all amazed in so much that they questioned amongst themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For what... For with authority commanded he even unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Okay, so they saw authority. Jesus didn't say, well, you know what? Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, I think that there are different options. It all depends on how you look at it. Uh, uh, you know, there are many people who believe in, believe in different ways. Other people don't know. He says, this is it. And that's what a lot of people, a lot of people, um, uh, how you call this, uh, they don't like, see, when we talk certainty, because they believe that we need to make room for other people's opinion, not when we are dealing with God. See, we cannot say it could be, it's up to you. Uh, it's like, for example, a teacher in school that supposedly, supposedly, a teacher cannot teach evolution in school as a fact. Now, a lot of people don't understand that and they have forgotten that they're supposed to teach it as what? A theory. theory. As a theory, as a, a belief, and the same thing as creation. They cannot teach creation as a fact. They have to teach both. But the one that prevails, of course, is the evolution. So this is not, well, uh, the world was made uh, by God, but there's also the possibility that evolution was uh, the way in which the world came into existence. Jesus did not teach in that manner. Neither can we if we are teaching the word of God. It's not the Bible plus this other book. It's not the Bible plus the Book of Mormons. It's not the Bible plus uh, the, the, the book of the Christian science with the key to the scriptures, which is the book that they use. Okay. 
It is the word of God and the word of God alone. It's the only thing that will feed your soul is this Bible here. You can read all the books and be edified and be blessed, but to do feeding to your soul, men shall not live with bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So uh, he taught with authority. He had authority over sicknesses, Demons, yes, demons exist. I have dealt with them. I, heard, I have heard them talk. Uh, he had, you have, yes, that's another lesson. Okay, he had authority over sickness, demons, elements of nature. He rebuked the winds. He rebuked the waves. He had power and authority over sin to forgive sins. He had power over death, and he had power over the devil. That's his divine authority. The authority of Christ was seen by the disciples. When they saw Jesus control and authority over his own and those that were not his own, he had authority over his disciples. Read verse 22. Let us go back to chapter six, uh, chapter 14, verse 22. This is very important. Every word is important. Verse 22. Walter, will you please read that one for me, please? Yeah, Mark 1, 22. No, 14, 22. Finally, I can hear your voice. I didn't hear your voice since last year. <laughs> you still have a voice. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, so Matthew 14. 14, 22. 22. Um, and straight away. Oh, Jesus right there. And straight away. Very important. Don't skate over the scriptures. Don't I skate over the scriptures. And straight away. Jesus what? Constrained. Mm, it's constrained. You see the importance? You need to have a dictionary. Constrained means, let's speak it in the, in the English language of every day. Not the ghetto language, but let us use it like that. Push, command his disciples. To do what? Walter? To get into a ship. Into a ship. And what? And to go before him onto the other side. A specific commands. No questions. Why? Why are you saying that? No, like children who ask the parents, why do I have to do it? There was authority in his way of speaking. Yeah. And uh, in your life, you will learn that the easy way or the hard way. Let's say that you go through your young, uh, young life doing whatever you want to, answering back to your mom, answer back to your father, and then you go into the army and then there's a sergeant waiting for you. And the sergeant said, from now on, I am your mom and your dad. Knock go ahead. Anything that you need, I will provide for you. Yes. Yes, what? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. And he begins to exercise his authority by the tone of his voice. Until later, they know. I remember my parents and uh, I still cry at certain moments when I see their pictures and my mom died in back in 84 my dad my dad died in 92 and uh, I could tell by the voice of my father and my mother 
when there was authority and that I did not, I could not afford to question that. They taught me that. Today you tell children go to bed, uh, the children don't go to bed and they keep playing. I told you to go to bed, but the children know that it's not time to go to bed yet, not until they get mad. Then when the parents get mad, now they know they have to go to bed. And that's where the father and the mother lose control because they have lost their authority and they don't have to go to bed until they are told about five times. Make the parents liars. Because when the parent says, you know, if you don't, do, you don't do this, I will spank you. And they don't. So I said, hmm, mom is a liar. So is dad. They, they don't spank me. They said they were going to, but they, I think they forgot. That happens in childhood, in many homes. Okay. But Jesus didn't speak like he was mad. There was authority in his voice. And he constrained them, not because he uh, lifted up a hand or because he uh, uttered uh, some kind of menace type of command. There was authority in his voice. And you should know that if you read the Bible. Do you remember when he met Matthew, the tax collector? Matthew was in the middle of transactions Tax collector. Jesus passed by and Jesus said, Follow me. Mm. What did the Bible say that Matthew did? Matthew got up and followed Jesus. Jesus didn't pull him, Jesus didn't promise him anything. Jesus only said, Follow me. That's divine authority. He told Peter, John, and uh, uh, James, when they were fishing, follow me. Left their ship, they left their nets. In other words, they left their business. No questions asked, and they followed him. There was an authority in his voice. You remember when, when the woman was caught in adultery and they brought her to Jesus because they want to stone her. And they tempted him saying, we caught, her, we caught her in the very act of adultery. What do you say? Because in the law, it says that such persons should be stoned. Jesus began to write on the ground. He didn't say a word. He raised his head and he says, he who has not seen, throw the first stone. Hmm. There was something in his voice. And the Bible said that one by one, they dropped the stones and they left. And the woman stayed there. Jesus raised her head, his head and said, woman, where are they that condemn you. He said, she says, all of them left. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Authority in his voice. And we see it here again. It's like, why are we obeying? There's something in his voice voice it's not threats he's not mad but here we are something in his voice so uh we see that he had authority over his disciples because jesus constrained them to do it why did jesus constrain constrain them to get in the boat and leave okay this is like a mystery okay why? Why did Jesus do that? Is there any reason? 
I want to meditate. I want to, I want to um, uh, stir your mind. Please think. Don't look, don't do like the woman, okay? That didn't know what she was doing. Let me tell you this little story because of some of you are so serious tonight. Maybe you're thinking, but this is a woman who is doing puzzles. She loves to do puzzles, okay? So all kinds of puzzles. And one day she's doing this puzzle, but things are not working out. So a neighbor knocks at her door and the neighbor says, what are you doing? She said, I'm, I'm doing a puzzle. The neighbor comes and looks at the table, you know, sees all the things scattered. And uh, she looks at it and said, where is the box? I said, what, what, what is this? It's a rooster. She was trying to do a rooster from the puzzle, okay? So the lady said, but show me the box. So she brings the box. The woman, the neighbor looks at the box and says, I think that it's time to put the cornflakes back into the box. Because what she had was a, a box of Telos cornflakes that has a rooster outside. And she thought that she was putting the puzzles. See, none of you got it except the ones that are older. No even sit there alone about it. None of you got it. Sister Madison is looking at me like, Sister Madison, have you ever seen a Kellogg's box? A rooster on it. He has a rooster on it. Hello. Hello. Cornflakes. Hello. Hello. Cornflakes. That was funny. Very funny. <laughs> you, have, you, you have never seen you have never seen a box of Kellogg's Corn Flake in Montana. We don't really eat cereal, so I don't really know. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Okay. Uh, Joseph, you got it. It's amazing. No, it's Corn Flakes. No, um, your audio cut out for me, so I couldn't hear part of your joke. What's the story of this woman that's trying to put together a puzzle and the box, you know, you say it was a rooster, but it was a, a, a box of cornflakes and she was trying to put it together. And the neighbor said, oh. after look, you know, it's time to put the cornflake back into the box because this is not a puzzle. This is a box of cornflakes. Anyway, all right, <laughs> let us keep going. Why did I waste that? <laughs> what a waste of time okay <laughs> let us see let us see oh, okay um jesus was trying to remove them from the temptation what temptation the people wanted to come and make jesus king and Jesus knew that the disciples that were still carnal, they were thinking about earthly glory. Jesus didn't want the disciples present because he knew that the multitude was going to come and try to make him king, according to the scriptures. So he removed them from the temptation. Because in John 6, 14, that's why you have to read different gospels to come to the comprehension of the understanding of a teaching. It's the same, the same story, okay? In John 6 and 14, and let's see what it says, 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, they were trying to make him a king by force. Okay? So Jesus wanted to remove them from that. And, uh, and the scripture says that Jesus, as we keep reading, uh, wanted to teach them a lesson in obedience. Why? 
somebody might say, but do you see all that there? Yes, when you study the Bible, that's what happens. When you meditate in what you're reading, when you check verse with verses, then you get the pieces of the puzzle and no conflicts. <laughs> okay, so why Jesus wanted to teach them a lesson in obedience? Because the disciples that were fishermen knew that a storm was coming. A fisherman can tell the story. The others that are not fishermen can tell because they don't know the sea nor the clouds. But the disciples, most of them fishermen, knew that there was a storm approaching. And Jesus is telling them, get on a boat and go out to sea. No doubt that they saw the storm. But they were obedient to Jesus' words and continue forward, even though the wind was contrary. They got into the boat, and pretty soon, as soon as the boat, uh, they begin to row and, and begin to sail, all of a sudden, a wind came. That fast? Yes. A wind can come real fast. One time I was fishing with somebody in a boat, and uh, it was one of my first experiences going out at night fishing. And uh, the person that was the one who was leading the whole thing, I didn't know nothing about fishing at night. Uh, he told me, uh, lift up or, or lift up the anchor because uh, something is coming. I said, what? What is coming? He says, don't ask me questions. Just raise the anchor. So I did. And all of a sudden, the boat did like this and turned. Because a wind was coming, I did not realize it, but it did. And the wind can change real fast. Mm. Jesus knew that he wanted to teach them a lesson in obedience. No matter what you see, obey me. What a lesson for you and what a lesson for me. We don't always understand, sure. but we obey. We obey God. Why should we obey God? Because God loves us. And because God will take care of us, regardless of what happens. You learn that. And that's why when God says, go this way, and you say, how can I? I don't see a way out. God says, keep walking. The door or the gate will open, and you will be able to get across. That's why we obey God. That's my testimony. You can argue with me anything you want to, but you can now argue me out of what I have experienced in my life. You obey God, and God opens gates and doors and ways because you learn to trust in what God says. And he taught him a tremendous lesson that night. As you read, uh, you saw what happened, right? Not yes. only he was teaching them a lesson in obedience, and not only did he show them the authority of Jesus over the multitudes, because he told the multitudes, listen to this. Wow, how can you overlook this? Verse 22, and we'll finish. Uh, 14, verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship, and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes, multitudes, multitudes away. This is Jesus with multitudes. And he, tell, he tells the multitudes, go away. It is finished. The lesson is over. Class is over. Go home. The multitude recognize also the authority in his voice. Can God, and I finish with this, can God make you serve him? Yes, he can. And why he won't? Because he wants to give you a choice. That's why he loves you. He doesn't have to give you a choice. He can command you. And believe me,
you'll have to obey whether you like it or not. And you'll have to bow in fear and trembling. Yeah. But he's giving you the choice of serving him, of coming to him, of your own will. I appreciate that mercy and the goodness of God in giving me, giving me, okay, an opportunity to choose whom I will serve and whom I will worship. So if you have any questions related to this, we haven't finished, we're gonna keep it because there's a lot of things in there. Is there any questions? Did you get anything from this lesson? Anybody? Yes. 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 Ricardita, you got anything from this? You did? Okay. Yes, I did.